All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to the May recap session of um, Fridays with Fiscal on a Wednesday. <laughs> um, I, if anyone is tuning in again to the payroll portion, again, we had a little miscommunication, <clears throat> excuse me, on Friday. Um, I had actually already logged on and Michelle had sent out a message and saying that it was canceled. So if you were there on Friday, because I did have some people log in, I appreciate you coming back for the second time. <laughs> and today we will have the USAS and the inventory section as well. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I will go ahead and go over the uh, payroll portion. So let me just go in here. Um, if you're not familiar with it, we do have a uh, release recap section now on the SSDT meetings and training page on the wiki. So it's cleared at the bottom here, and then you just uh, click on the calendar year, and then obviously whichever month we're, we're talking about the release for. So I'll go ahead and click on the May option. And I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down to the payroll releases. <clears throat> So we had releases, regular releases on May 6th and May 20th. And then we had a bunch of hot fixes in between there. We had a hot fix on May 10th, 11th, and 24th. But we're gonna go ahead and go over the, the pretty much the highlights from the releases that we sent out. So uh, one thing that we did, um, <clears throat> they improved um, how the increased compensation value was found when uh, running the SRS advance. There were some issues with that last year. So the developers have corrected that. So this year it should work much better. Um, we also uh, fixed it. So now a user cannot enter a reg pay type for an employee when that employee is in advance. Last year, we found out that, that that was actually a possibility, so we needed to correct it because you, you should not be using a right pay type when an employee is in advance. Uh, the other thing that we fixed for the SRS advance um, section was uh, the advanced calculations will only use position level STRS items when they're present. So if uh, an employee has more than one STRS payroll item set up, maybe they have position level set up on one or two of them. Now the system is going to actually be able to look at that and correctly calculate that based on those position levels. Um, another thing that we corrected, the uh, leave projection was actually requiring an unnecessary permission for employee, an employee. Um, which basically allowed them to view and, and process the audit report. So we uh, corrected that. And so now all they need to have to run a leave projection or you know, leave uh, projection option would be uh, to have the standard user role. Before they had to have the module audit view option and that was not very um, efficient. So now they can just have the standard user role and they should be able to go in to uh, reports, uh, leave projection, and run any of the reports that are out there. And they will not have access to the audit report. Um, another thing that we corrected, and I'll kind of show you this on the screen. Let me pull up a, a, a test instance here. Maybe. Um, what we did for future pay, we were having a problem because they made some corrections where when you go in and, and create uh, a future pay, so if you're using the create new option, so let me just kind of show you that as we go through. What was happening is you use the create new option, so that basically kept the same employee or you could add another employee, but we were keeping the same employee. What was happening is um, it would pull in the correct rate when you pulled the employee in, but then after you after you added the record and wanted to create another one, that rate was gone or it was incorrect. So we have fixed that now. So let me go in and just show you what it's supposed to do. 
Let's see. Oh, I don't want that. I want the driver. All right, we'll just go in and add. And you'll see here his rate pulled in from his compensation record. Okay. So I have the create new option chosen up here in the left hand corner. So once I go in and I save this record, that 17.047 should be retained, which it is. Now, that's not saying that I can't go back in here and make a change when I'm creating a new record. So maybe I want to change that rate to $25. And the nice thing is after I save that, it should revert back, which it did. And before it was not doing that. So we've corrected that now so that all works correctly. Um, another huge thing that we had, this was actually sent out on a hot fix. We found that um, when, in, when a, an administrator or the employee changed their password, it was actually um, going to a database table as plain text. So that meant that it actually could have been audited, which would mean that you could actually see the password on the audit report. So we corrected that because never should you be able to see someone's password. And so that was corrected and fixed on a hot fix that we released because obviously passwords are very sensitive. We don't want anything happening with those. So um, the hot fix removed the possible stored passwords from the audible events table. So even though it was doing that, you know, if, if that occurrence happened where um, during the time that we did the release and the, and the hot fix, if a password was saved on the audible, audible events, it actually was then removed. So, so you can never see the password now. Um, another thing that we fixed was um, the attendance entry order was causing an error when you entered them as like maybe you were entering the same day for an employee so um let me go back in here and i'll just kind of show you what i'm talking about <clears throat> what what happened is an error was occurring if a district would go in and let's just say they were adding an absence day for may 31st for an employee and they wanted they entered um maybe 1.25 hours for one job and an hour and one or 0.5 days for another job. Well, but it was all the same date. What was happening is an error was being thrown because of that, saying, you know, you're you're entering more than one day. That was not the case. Now, if you entered it the other way, where you entered the day first and the hour second, then you didn't get the error. So we've corrected that so that will no, no longer uh, throw an error when that entry is being done in uh, our and then uh, day uh, option or format. Um, something else that we did is after using the compensation print screen, we uh, an ITC or a district found that the days worked um, being displayed in the compensation is not accurate. So on the print screen, when you were printing it, the day's work were not appearing correctly based on what was on the compensation record. So the developers made the change and fixed that. Now the print screen, day's uh, print screen for compensation will accurately display the day's work on the, from the compensation record. Um, for an employee onboarding, the contract work days were not uh, coming over to the dashboard correctly. So that also has been corrected. So now the that uh, the days contract days work will not be displayed accurately when you're doing using employee onboarding. Uh, we had an ITC report that a district had um, on their ODGFS submission file actually had negative amounts appearing on that file, and ODGFS will not accept negatives. They had to be zeros. So we uh, we fixed this. So now, if the gross or tax amounts uh, for ODGFS are negative, then it will replace those or convert those to zeros before actually uh, being allowed to create the ODGFS submission file. So no longer will there be any negatives on that file if that would would be the case. 
Um, another thing that we did, and this is kind of a big thing because um, we had a few districts ask about this. When you have an employee, or I should say employees, and if you use the uh, leave projection option, so maybe, maybe you know, your district doesn't run it but once a year, or maybe they run it every quarter, et cetera. Well, what was happening is if they had leave entered in for an employee, okay, and then that employee left. So that means maybe they unchecked the eligibility flag on the position record saying, yeah, they're no longer eligible for leave because they didn't want them uh, accumulating leave. What was happening when they tried to run the leave projection whenever they run it, um, they were getting all kinds of errors saying, hey, the employee isn't eligible for leave. That was causing a problem. So we actually uh, fixed it. So we skipped the validation and events when they're processing the projection. So that should no longer happen. You know, obviously if a leave was entered in a tennis screen um, and they want to run leave projection, that should be allowed. You should allow, you know, allow that to be processed through. So um, that will no longer produce that, out, that error that the employee is not eligible for leave. And you should be able to run that and get any employees that maybe have left and they're no longer eligible for leave, but that they had uh, leave entered at that specific time they're running leave projection for. Um, some improvements that were made on these releases. Uh, the first one, we improved the performance of the reports that are processed during uh, payroll. So all the different pay reports that are out there, like the payroll item report, the pay report itself, payroll item summary report, um, budget distribution report, pay account uh, report, or report, I can't say it here. Um, they made improvements to all those different reports. So depending on which report you're processing, you could see a 53 to 80% improvement on the speed or on the, on the quickness of how that that report processes. Um, there were some layout changes to the compensation print screen report. Um, the compensation, well, hold on, let me go back here so you can see this. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, the compensation description and that supplemental taxing option that, that are on the compensation screen. So let me just show you here real quick what we're talking about. Sorry, my screen, my system is running a little slow this morning. All right. So what we're referring to is this description field here, and this applies annuity to supplemental option. What was happening is um, those fields were only seven characters long, and they should have been longer and be able to fit correctly on the print screen, they were not doing that. Um, one thing I did notice and I did kind of learn is, as I was, I kind of went in and tested this, but I noticed if I put this, like a description here with all numeric characters, the numerics were dropping down to the next line. But if I use alpha characters and then maybe a, one numeric or a couple numeric, those actually will print correctly on the print screen. So I'm gonna go ahead, you can see I have just some data in here, as well as the, I, I have this populated to apply annuities to supplemental. So when I go in and do a print screen, I should see that description and that full you know, supplemental text. And yeah, right here is my description. And then right down here is that supplemental taxing option. So we did make a correction to that for the print screen. And then another thing that we also did, and I could just show you here, is we uh, corrected the salary schedule because it wasn't appearing where it was supposed to be appearing. It should have been appearing under the compensation amounts and it wasn't. So now we have corrected that on the print screen. So it now shows 
accurately when you actually use the print screen option. Um, another thing, another improvement that we made uh, for employee onboarding, we added some missing compensation fields. Um, there was, there's a section on the compensation record that's called historical context right down here. And that actually was not showing correctly on the employee onboarding. So we actually corrected that. So it now shows accurately with the calendar start date and the calendar stop date. And then the other thing that we fixed was there should not, uh, there should be no retirement hours under the general section on this and, and retirement hours were appearing under the general section. So they actually corrected that as well for employee onboarding. Another thing that we have uh, improved on, and this I thought was, it's getting better as far as the pay accounts, but what we can do now is you can actually go in for your pay account if you're adding a specific pay account for an employee. So let me just go in here and I will do an add. And if obviously if an employee, if they should have a pay, pay account or pay accounts already defined on the pay account screen, which will be found only under this expenditure account field. So what I can do before you had to enter in like dashes or slashes when you were entering the, the pay account. No, you no longer have to do that. You can just enter a string of characters. So I just started with 001 and you can see that obviously this employee must only have one pay account on their pay account screen. So I could then go in and select it. If they had more, I could select the accurate pay account that I wanted to use. Now, if none of the pay accounts that I want to use are in there, which is very possible when you're adding a, mis a miscellaneous specific pay account, you could go to the little magnifying glass. And when you do that, all of the pay accounts, expenditure accounts that are actually available will appear. And then you can filter using this XREF code or the description. So if you know the name of the account, you could just start typing in. This doesn't help me much because all of these say that. Here, let me do elementary. Hold on. Now what happened there? There we go, general elementary. So then I could filter, keep filtering down, you know, if I knew the full name, and then I could select the account. Or if I knew the account number, I can just start uh, going in and entering a string of numbers. I'm not doing this, there we go. And then it actually filters it down so it, it allows me then to select the account by clicking on it and then click the select account option. And then that account will be used when I do the confirm selection. It'll actually put that account in the expenditure account field and then I'll just save that. So it do, it is, a, I mean, there's a, another step where you're having to click, but it is a little bit better as far as like filtering and finding the accounts that you're wanting. You can use a description, you can use the, uh, the XREF code and just type in a string of numbers. Um, another very big, I think very big improvement that we made is uh, we updated the mid-year contract. So in the past, what happened is if an employee had a mid-year contract change and then they had another one, so maybe they had multiple mid-year contract changes, Redesign just could not uh, go back, back far enough to do calculations accurately. So what we've done is um, we've carried forward the contract values pretty much similar to how Classic worked um, for mid-year contract changes. So what we did is um, we 
we are pulling over the work days, the day's work, the pays in the contract, and pays paid for the new contract. And then the contract obligation, the contract um, amount, amount earned, amount paid, amount due, paper period, unit amount, um, and retro next pay have been updated to match how classic did the calculations. And we're not any, we're no longer going to carry forward those fields like the remaining amount, the, like the remaining pays and the work days and the accrued wages into new contract. It's very going to be more similar to how classic was, but it should work much better. Um, one thing that we did know um, when we did the new contract, when we changed that on the release, is if there were existing mid-year contract change in the new contract screen um, prior to the update that was made on that release, they can be activated using the old method of calculation um, if they were if they were activated without recalculating. So you may have to do a recalculation. Um, if you'd like to have the mid-year new contract recalculated using the new method, you can edit the mid-year contract and then just click the uh, recalculate button and it would have recalculated those that figure for you. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it for new contract. Uh, we have like a whole, obviously in the documentation, we have how this works now. So again, I think it's going to be much better, a lot better than it was because we were having a lot of problems with uh, calculations not being accurate when major contract was used, even if it was just one time. So we've hopefully got that corrected. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we improved on was the employee master report. Um, that has kind of been a problem off and on, but uh, we, we improved it so that the report will generate a lot faster. And then the data is now going to be in the same order. Before we made these corrections, the order of the, of the data, like employee position, et cetera, was kind of scattered. And so we've, made, we've corrected that. So now it'll always be in the same order when that report is processed. And if you have, if you have a district that uses custom fields and has data in those fields, those will get included on the report. If a custom uh, field has no data in it, it will not get pulled into the report. Um, something else that we improved on, we just added, which is really kind of nice, is the, the payroll accounts new option. And this is really, really nice because you can see the full pay account it, when, as soon as it pulls up. Like I said, my system's running a little slow. <clears throat> but what it's going to do, if it ever comes up, <laughs> Bear with me. There we go. But what it does is it shows you all of the payroll account dimensions. Now, if you did not want some of those dimensions appearing, you can go in. You can, you know, right, notice right now, we really don't have like a, an option, like the more option where you can search for certain uh, fields and have them included on the grid. But we do have this little uh, box here with these three lines. This will give you a few of the options that are available. But let's just say I didn't want instruction level, instructional level and job included in the dimensions on the grid. I can go in and remove those. But maybe I want the start date and the max and the max remaining. Oh, actually, the remaining you probably won't see yet because I think that's something that we're putting out on the next release. Um, I, my my uh, my instance already has it, but that will be something that you will be seeing. So I guess that's something you can look forward to. <laughs> um, and you know, and you'll notice here you cannot currently run a report from the grid, but at least it is something that will help you look at pay accounts. Maybe you want to filter for just a certain pay account, maybe a certain function. You can actually do that. 
by just you know typing in the equal and then typing in the function number that you're looking for, then it'll pull in only those particular accounts with that function. Um, this is a work in progress. And if you, you know, want to give us some feedback, just let, you know, send a ticket. We can add that out there because the programmers or the developers are basically, you know, looking for to keep improving this. But for now, it's something that is available to you at least to look at and to use. And then, like I said, this right now is kind of your only more or your option to include um, fields on the grid. Um, let's see. We do have documentation out there as well for this. So if you need to go out to the documentation and look at that, we have it available as well. Something else that we added was out in utilities. We have those W2 city override options. Well, before you could only go in, maybe you wanted to create one. Well, when you created, you didn't really know like what you were, you know, what fields you needed or what values you needed to put in in order to create this record. Well, now you'll see we have this help box here. So actually all that information is available. That way you can go in and enter the information in accordingly without having to you know, go back and forth because before we did have it available, but it wasn't like where you could actually keep seeing it all the time. Now that was the create option, but you can also see it when you're in the modify or view option as well. So that box is available in any of the views. That way you can see it makes it a little bit easier for you instead of trying to have to uh, do a screenshot and keep it and you know remember what those values are you can just easily see them on that help box now um some new features that we added um if a district uh, uh bases their s their strs um calculations on earnings which throughout the state there probably are not a whole lot of them you know, unless they, maybe they have a year on school or something like that. Um, but we, a classic, we always had the, uh, that option available. So in redesign, we have actually updated it. So now if a district uh, bases their advance on earnings, um, there actually is an option where they can go out and say, yeah, we base it on earnings. And then that way, when they're running the, the, the SRS advance, if they run the SR advanced positions report, they should be getting nothing because no one will be advancing because um, no um, accrued wages are being or, or, be, or contributions are being um, submitted. Those were actually already withheld when they were paid during the, during the year. It just actually, it actually takes those contributions and the earnings, and you send those to SR each pay. So that's why that uh, based on withholdings on earnings um, is now available. But again, we don't really think there's too many districts that use it. Um, we did add a check distribution field to the XML. Um, so what I can do, let me just go out to the payroll and I can show you. Um, it's, so. Well, what we did is we added the, in the XML file, which is the file that usually they send to their check printing software. Um, if they have a check distribution field and they have that populated and they want that information on the checks, it's now available um, on, on the, uh, the, the uh, file that goes to your check printing software. And uh, we did send a message out to all of the, uh, third party vendors before we actually made the release. So they all knew that we added this, um, this token or this field to the XML file. So if I go to process payments and I'll just do direct deposits real quick here. And then I'll just show you, I, I went in and added a couple um, check distributions. And that check distribution field can be found on the employee record. So if that, that field is populated and you want that to be included on your direct deposits, um, 
you can actually now see that because it's now available. Okay, let me just find you here. So right here, this check distribution, and I had just typed in testing. You can see that this is now on the XML file that you're going to be sending to be printed out. If the district wants to use that, uh, that field on an employee record. Um, another improvement or thing that we added, which was requested by a couple of different districts, I believe, um, on the home screen, you'll now be able to see the, uh, the bank account information, the highest check number displayed, and then the bank account description. So you can see right here, this highest check numbers, bank account description, and then the highest check number. So that's the last check number that was used. And then one thing to keep in mind, um, if the user has the permissions, of the, there's a US, USPS manager bank account view and a USPS standard payment transaction view, then they will be able to see this data on the home screen. If they do not have those privileges or those rules assigned to them, they will not be seeing the highest check numbers option on the home screen. And then we had saw a couple different patches, but those were for specific, specific districts. So other than that, that's pretty much everything for the payroll portion um, for the May releases. Are there any questions? Okay. I think Amanda is going to be doing the USAS portion. So Amanda, if you want to go ahead and take it away here. Sounds good. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. Um, okay, let me see. There we go. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm back on the um, recap page for May and I'm right up at the top here with the USAS items. Um, let me just move my stuff around real quick. Okay, so um, within May, we had two regular releases and a hot fix. Um, and those are listed here with links to go to like the um, direct release information pages. Um, but just to go over the different items that were included here, I'm going to start with bug fixes. And the first one, the account change process was corrected to properly handle overpaid purchase orders. This happened a couple of times. There were a, spe a couple specific districts that had reported um, that they were seeing something odd on some POs. We tracked that to account change. And what happened is that um, it was happening if they're in the current year. Um, a PO line item had been overpaid of the original encumbrance amount and then changed. That math just wasn't working out correctly. We corrected those for those districts and we also located the issue and um, fixed that so that it won't happen anymore. The next one here. Um, so this one is um, part of the hot fix and actually it happened in USAS and in USPS. So Lori has um, sort of talked about this um, a bit at, um, in her section and uh, just a minute. Okay. Um, so what we did, and I'm gonna, this kind of goes with this next one here too. So I'm gonna kind of explain this bug fix and this improvement together, but we'll hop in and look at these um, in the actual software in a minute. So what we did is um, we updated uh, within the system on um, 8.46 to be able to track when passwords were changed. So make it a little bit easier if you're trying to see for security purposes when a password change event happened and um, that can be viewed in the app log. But as Lori explained um, for USPS, it was also happening in USAS where at the very, very start, 
um, it had the potential to actually be um, tracking what the password was. And that, of course, is something that we don't want to happen. So um, in the hotfix, we prevented that from happening in the future. Um, it also would remove any possible stored passwords. So if they were in there, they were removed. Um, however, we also included this suggestion. If any users had changed their passwords within that time, um, you can run a report. Um, and then if there are any users that had changed their password in that time, we recommend that they could just, they would just do another password reset, like a just in case. Um, so I'm in USAS here and okay. So I'm just going to go to my system monitor to show you the original update of, um, kind of tracking this information to show you the spot that you can see it. Um, and I'm going to system monitor and the app log tab. So I came in here earlier and just went ahead and changed it real quick. So right here, I just clicked on this very first row. It shows us the info level and it shows me, okay, admin password change event. And then um, the username that I changed was Amanda. <clears throat> and then, um, so that's updated in there. The other place that you can see this and what we recommend to go um, like run it by the certain dates. Um, again, let me flip back here. Uh, these were the dates, five, six to five, 10. So um, if I'm in the report manager here, it's the auditable events template report. So if I pull this down, um, when you have query options, you have a start and end date. So if you run this from 5.6 to 5.10, that will help you look up if there were any password changes in that time for users that need to recommend a password change. Um, this report, it might take a while if they had a lot of activity in those days. So I would just plan to like run this on the side, you know, let it give it adequate time to run. Um, I'm just going to run it for today so you can see what it looks like because I did that password. I know I have a password change in there today. Um, and some quick scrolling here because I know it's at the end. It looks like this right here, this last line. Let me zoom in a little bit. So we can see here, um, I changed it with my admin account. It was a password change event, which you could even do like a control find um, for password change event once you, if you generate this report and it's large. Um, and then it tells me right here, this was the username that was changed. Okay. And let me switch back over here. Okay, so that covers these two. So basically just this improvement was the improvement to have that included. And then this one up here under the bug fixes was the correction to that. Okay, um, we also have started to work on uh, different pieces for the 1099 printing. So um, we're kind of starting to get some of these in here. Everything's not just like boom in there at once. We're kind of releasing it as different pieces are finished. And that's what this is. So um, the 1099 PDF documents um, were created for both the, the 1099 MIST and the NEC copies. And the copies that you'll see in there are reference copies. So um, I didn't have the screenshot didn't let me show all of them. So I'm going to come back in here. And so what this is, so if I, you know, for either one of these or both, this output file type, I now have a section for reference copies. And this drop down, I have copy one, two, B, and C. And these all correspond to different copies that like um, are sort of defined by IRS. Um, we are, we do have like more that we're going to be adding. Um, and I will tell you, we've already talked, they're going to widen this window so you can see it say like reference copies. So that will be updated um, to just look a little bit better visually. Um, but basically, what these are, if you were to select these, um, it would be like a PDF copy to save. So you could generate all of them as PDFs. You know, that's kind of the file that, you know, you might save 
uh, send to the district to have a, a file on hand or um, a copy that the ITC would keep, you know, whoever um, would hold on to those copies. But um, here I got, um, made sure I had one with some data in here. So here's an example of copy one, and they're pretty similar. Like it, it says the different copy and then like what the IRS has it for over here. Um, so it's basically just a PDF and then this is what's showing on it. Um, we do have, um, along with these copies, the they are working on the printer uh, seal or the folder sealer uh, version as well that has uh, both of the copies that they need to send to the vendor. So um, that one's still in the works, but this is kind of the first step to get these in here. And that could just kind of shows you, you know, where those are gonna be and, and how that'll look. Um, and then, so if you select one of these here, um, you know, this information here still applies. And then it's just the generate um, button still. So it would be kind of like the same functionality as if you were making like XML, you would generate, um, you could pick any of these copies and generate. And we are um, also working on a way to like um, be able to prompt all of them to run at once. So um, I'm sure we'll have more updates related to these 1099 copies on our future recap, um, our release recaps. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, as far as patches, we had one patch to clean up bad data migrated from Classic for just one specific district that had migrated um, a while ago. It was prior to the ability to post encumbrance impacts. So that was something where, you know, um, it was just, you know, an exception uh, situation that had to be done for, for a specific entity. And then um, we, I have some internal things noted here because there are some things that the team is doing that maybe like, you know, we're not seeing like directly in the software as far as, you know, okay, I have the screenshots for this, but there are a couple of things that they've been working on um, as well that they've been putting time to. Uh, one of those was researching the different fillable file types to help facilitate the generation of 1099 print files. And the other one, um, they had it listed as transfer service improvements. I looked into this one a little bit and basically this was, um, they had to spend some time testing to make sure that certain changes made in USPS didn't impact the workflows process in a negative way. So I'm kind of ensuring that everything stays working there with some of these new uh, pieces that have been implemented. Okay, well, um, that is all I have for the use ask portion. Does anybody have any use ask questions before we move on to inventory? All righty. Well, I think Michelle's gonna hop on here and go over inventory. So um, we'll get switched over. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to cover um, what has taken place on the inventory release um, in the month of May. Uh, we had two releases, 116 and 117. And so um, we had some bug fixes and we had an improvement um, that we needed to do uh, regarding um, admin passwords. And so regarding the bug fixes, um, the first one here, we did correct a problem with operating leases. Uh, they were showing as capitalized in redesign and they should not be. So we made that correction on the 116 release. I think it was uh, your issue 313. Um, and so um, what happened is, you know, those now, you know, migrate over, they will not show as capitalized anymore. But um, if you had um, existing operating operating releases that were showing as capitalized, um, running the capitalization criteria underneath the system menu will fix those. Um, but this will be prevented from here on out with future migrations. 
Uh, the next one, um, group manager in standard user roles. Um, we had to update them in order to include them to be able to run the capitalization criteria. Um, it was just locked down to admin access. Um, and so we made that update as well on 116. So it mimics what um, Classic did. So anyone with a standard role or a group manager role, obviously, as well as admin roles, um, will be able to run the capitalization criteria option underneath system. Um, the next one, item grid export has been corrected to allow exporting data for tag numbers that have been changed. This was kind of a little bit of a unique situation where a tag number was changed. Um, on an item, and then when they went to extract the items um, off of the items grid, it stopped extracting at that particular tag. And so we have fixed that now. So if you know you are going in and changing tag numbers, updating them um, in the items um, option, that um, and you then you know later go in and extract data that included one of those, it should extract fine. The next one, fixed asset by source report. Um, it, we, we've been having some issues with um, some of the gap reports regarding items that do not have a fund number. Now we all know looking at you know, some of the data that we're seeing um, in the district's um, classic data that they could have a missing fund and a missing function or a missing asset. Those are all considered warnings and they show up on the import log to show as warnings. They've probably been like that for years. Um, and so um, they do come over the same way that they did in classic. They come over the same way in redesign. Um, but we were having some trouble with some of those not being accounted for on the gap report. So we did make some changes on that on the um, on that particular uh, release, but we also found a couple more issues um, with the fixed asset report, and that those are going to be resolved on um, the 118 release, which comes out next week, and that's uh, JIRA issue 336. So we have some a uh, little bit more work to do um, cleaning up those particular issues where the fund number is not included on the item record. Um, so, um, so like I said, that will come out uh, next week and we shouldn't have any other issues that we're aware of with those um, reports regarding empty uh, funds. Um, one of the things that I love that came out, and I, I guess you could consider it a bug fix, I kind of consider it an improvement, but it was, there were some certain things that weren't working properly, is the filtering. Um, we have done some big improvements on the filtering. I'm gonna to go to my items grid here. And in here, what we've done is we've corrected amount filtering, tag number filtering, and the date filtering. Um, so now filtering works so much better um, in the grids. And I'll just give you some examples here with like the amount filtering. This over. Um, we've got, um, uh, it's all, it's including the decimal now. So if I type in something like 1016.60, um, it's including that and being able to filter with the decimal. So it just pulls those particular um, items that contain that full amount. Um, also tag number filtering, that. this is like my favorite one. Um, so if I just go in and enter like um, a nine. So um, this is a good example here because what it's doing is it's showing me anything that starts with a nine. And before it just didn't give you anything because it was looking for a tag number that was just a tag number of nine. And so they've changed this now. So I can start you know, just entering, keep entering more and it'll keep filtering more. Um, so that's really nice, um, big um, improvement on that. And, you know, kind of works as a range as well. You still have the wildcards, the percent sign, so you can still use that as well. But I have a feeling a lot of people will just start entering information and tag numbers and it will just start filtering for them. Um, the date filtering, let me pick on the acquisition date here. Um, you know, you can use equal signs in here if you want to. If you just put in like a 101, 2005, 
It's going to bring up any items that have that acquisition date. And we also improved, we were having some issues with the greater than less than. And so obviously those are working now. So if I do uh, greater or uh, greater than, it's going to show anything after uh, January 1st of 2005. And then I also do a less than, and it'll show anything before that. Um, so some big improvements on the filtering capabilities. So I'm, I'm really liking that. Okay, I'll go back to our list here. And let's see. Um, with um, the 117 release, we also um, made some updates um, regarding an issue with um, the system import. Um, what was happening is it was not properly setting some of the enum value fields, which are listed before. If you're like, what are the enum value fields? Um, lease payment period, depreciation method, item status, and insurance class. Um, if, um, I think the issue was, if those fields were not included in the CSV, fi CSV file when you were updating items through the system item import option, um, it was making them blank. And so we corrected that so that it doesn't uh, remove what was in there. Um, it just leaves those alone. So it ignores those. Um, so that's been corrected. And another issue that came through in one of our tickets was regarding um, item grid filtering. Uh, changes were preventing um, the creation of transfer transactions. So we corrected that on the 117 as well. When, they, when people were trying to create transfer transactions, they were getting an error. And it, and it came back to some item grid filtering changes that we had recently made. So we fixed that as well in the 117 release um, so that people don't get that error when they're trying to do a transfer transaction. Um, and then a technical change that we made and this was like a unique situation where um, NITC had uh, added in expiration dates on the admin account. Those don't, um, those aren't um, included on there by default. Um, so they were added um, and then it met that expiration date and they couldn't get back in. Um, so um, we have fixed some of those property files that are out there in our inventory installation and migration guide so that um, if that does happen again, um, we've got information in the inventory migration guide in order to prevent that, in order for them to get logged in just fine. Um, so it was kind of just a unique situation where there was an expiration date on um, the admin account. So um, if that does happen and that date does get met, these steps in the inventory installation and migration guide that's all laid out here um, will allow um, you to go back in and access that instance. Um, and it will basically allow you to restart the instance and it will plug in um, the original admin password so that you can log in. Um, it basically just resets it. Um, and so that's it for um, the 117. The 118 release will be out um, June 17th, I believe, a week from now, week and a half from now. Um, we had to push back the release date on the inventory releases so that they lined up with USAS and payroll. So now USAS payroll inventory all get released on the same day. Um, so that's why there was like a three week lull period there um, for the inventory releases instead of the regular two week. We had to add an extra week on so that they all come out at the same time. Um, so obviously, if these are um, things that you want to look into as to, you know, what's going to be on the next release, you can always go into JIRA and look up, you know, what's scheduled for the 118 release and that information will, will be out there for you. Okay, any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank you guys for um, attending our Wednesday Fridays with Fiscal. And uh, we will be um, having another session on actually Friday. 
Um, we're going to go over AP uh, invoicing uh, tips and tricks. Amanda will be doing that session Friday morning at nine. So we will see you guys then. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.